Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Lugo's Journey podcast. Today, I have on a great, great guest with me. He is also known as Sugar Mama Health, if I'm correct. Sugar Mama. <laughs> exactly. Hello, Sugar great Mama. name. But everybody, welcome in, Dr. Scott. Introduce yourself. Hey, so yeah, and my last name is Spiridigliosi, so it's Dr. Scott Spiridigliosi. That's how you pronounce it. Very Italian last name. Uh, yeah, so I am uh, basically. He said, "I like that sugar mama." It's it's um it's very close. <laughs> it's it's uh, super mama health. Um, super mama health. Super go. mama. Yeah. So sugar mama, super mama. Um, and so basically, I'm a naturopathic doctor. And if you're not familiar with that, is it's basically, it's very similar to a, a MD. Uh, so I get the same kind of training. I I learned all about diseases and and um you know dr- what drugs to use for those diseases. But I also learn a lot about nutrition. I learned about really how do you prevent something from happening. So as opposed to just, you know, if the check engine light comes on in the car, instead of just putting a bandit over the light, I want to figure out why the light come on to even begin with. And so that's really focusing on the root cause and figuring out, you know, what's really causing the issue as opposed to just suppressing it with symptoms. And um, so basically, yeah, I really, my, my, I focus on nutrition. I focus on fitness, mostly lifestyle management. So what, how do we how do I help people with their lifestyle, which includes, like I said, sleep, our stress, uh, our nutrition, our mindset, of course, which is, I know you know how huge that is. Um, so that's really where I'm coming from. So it's how do I help people with their lifestyle so they can have sustainable results um, as opposed to just a quick fix. So how do you find that uh, the best way to do it is? Do you find that the best way to do it in your practice is to sort of help with the psychological aspect of it and telling people, you know, this is how you make a change in your life. You've got to make these lifestyle changes and it's got to start up here. Or do you usually do it from the environment type perspective? Uh, yeah. So the way I usually start it is, I mean, I believe in education, you know, first and foremost, so helping my patient or client understand the reason, you know, let's say they, they're having a hard time losing weight, which is super common. And first, uh, you know, I always want to do some sort of, uh, you don't need to do labs with everybody, but there's certain labs that are really helpful to do. And we can talk about that more later if you want. Um, but basically, I want to help them understand the underlying reason for why they're having a hard time losing weight. And then once I teach them that, I really believe in teaching and empowering them so they understand it. And then when they understand it, I can then link lifestyle changes and, and talk about how those lifestyle changes are going to actually address the specific reasons for why it's so hard for them to lose weight. Uh, for example, if someone is hard, having a hard time losing weight, they're typically, um, there's a hormone called insulin. And the, uh, are you familiar with that term with, it, uh, with insulin? Well, that's what people with diabetes don't have, right? They don't. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, there's two types of diabetes. So like there's type one where they don't have enough insulin. There's type two where they actually have too much insulin, but their body is just not responding to it anymore. That's called insulin resistance. So people that have a hard time losing weight, they often have insulin resistance, which means their cells are no longer responding to insulin. And what insulin does, is it's supposed to bring blood sugar into the cells. And that's how basically our cells get fed. And what happens is insulin is knocking on the door, but no one's opening up. So there's no blood sugar coming in. And when insulin levels get too high in the body, that it actually tells our fat cells, okay, so we have all this blood sugar in our blood because it, it won't go into our cells. So now we need to take it and move it into the fat cells and store it as energy for later, which is called body fat. So people that have a hard time losing weight, they typically have higher levels of insulin. And so teaching somebody how is their nutrition, how is eating a more lower carb kind of diet, how is uh, improving their sleep, how is stressing less going to improve their insulin? And so it's when they understand, as opposed to me just telling them, you know, you need to eat this, this, and this, and don't eat this without actually explaining why they need to do that, then it just doesn't stick. So the way I find most effective is actually teaching them, you know, why I think they should do X, Y, or Z to help them lose the weight. So yeah, it has definitely mindset. And when I say mindset, definitely teaching them about why they're doing what they're doing. I think that's, that's incredibly powerful. So you're saying, especially because, you know, obesity, I'm pretty sure According to the CDC, I actually read this today, 42% of adults in America are obese, not overweight, but obese. So are you saying that for those people, the people who don't even have diabetes, they still are struggling with um, 
with problems of getting insulin into their cells, even though they don't have type 2 diabetes? Yeah, so a lot of them, and you can do this with a blood test, but yeah, one thing that you can just, not, not everyone that's overweight has an insulin problem, but a lot of them most likely do. And yeah, so addressing that insulin is going to be huge. And a lot of that's going to come down to nutrition. Um, and then also just to uh, reword just what you said, just so you, you know, your audience understands. So yeah, insulin yeah, is, course. insulin is, it doesn't go into the cells. It's basically the, the gatekeeper and it opens the door for sugar to come in. Cause sugar is what like glucose is the same mm-hmm. thing as uh, blood sugar and glucose is what fuel is one of the things that fuels our cells. So we need insulin to open that door and now glucose can come into the cell. So the cell can use it for energy. Um, but in these people that have a hard time losing weight, they're typically, their insulin is not able to open the door. So blood sugar goes up and now we have all this energy in our blood in the form of sugar or glucose. And then our body, our liver will, can, will turn that sugar into fat. And then that goes into our fat cells. So, you know, addressing the insulin is one, one thing. Um, wow, that, that sucks. So you're saying that we eat food or carbs or sugar for energy, but yeah. since we don't have enough insulin, we still can't even get the energy because, or since our insulin doesn't work properly, yeah. we still can't get enough energy because the sugar can't even go into our cells. Exactly. So now our cells are starving because they can't get the energy and we're putting on weight. And because our cells are starving, our body then slows our metabolism down. So now, now we're gaining weight and we're, our metabolism is slowing and things are slowing down. Um, and so which means that, you're not metabolizing food as quickly, which means you're putting on more weight because you're not burning enough calories. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. Wow. That's, that's pretty. So do you, do you find that, I guess this isn't really something that the average person even I wouldn't even expect the average person to know this, right? So what do you find is a great way to educate people on just something, even through you or just in general, to be able to teach somebody about something that's so complex, but at the same time needs to be known? Yeah. Um, and I, can, I can teach something right now if you want, or you're asking for like another resource or something. I'm asking for both. First of all, okay. I'm interested in these stories. Tell me more. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, to go with the teaching part first, um, there's so thing as it relates to insulin and weight gain. There's one of the best things we can do for lowering our insulin is eating less processed uh, processed carbohydrates. So, think of you know anything that has white flour in it, um, rice, anything that has added sugar in it, anything that has added uh, like high fructose corn syrup. So, any kind of added sugar or processed carbohydrate that is going to raise our blood sugar and ultimately cause insulin issues. So always start with, I always start with nutrition. Um, and by the way, I don't like using the word diet because I think that's just, it has a very, very negative connotation. So I don't teach people about diet. I teach them about a way of living, a lifestyle of eating I so agree. that, because like if you, if you have a diet and then you fall off and you have, you know, something that maybe isn't the most nourishing or healthy, now you feel bad about yourself and you say that, oh, I'm bad because I did something bad versus a lifestyle. I teach you how do you actually be, you know, how do you intelligently incorporate some of your favorite foods so that you still lose the weight so you still get healthier um, without feeling bad about yourself. So it's all about really empowering and, and not having this negative mindset about our food because so many of us believe that we call food good or bad, which is just completely crap because food is, is not inherently good or bad. It's Instead, I want your, your listeners to, to think, is this food going to nourish me or is this food going to do harm to me? Uh, so as opposed mm-hmm. to thinking about, is this food good or bad? I want, I want them to ask, is this going to nourish me or is this going to do harm to me uh, or not nourish me? Because now it's, it's a function of, well, do I want to nourish my body? Yes, of course I do. So, uh, but that doesn't like, you know, on Thanksgiving, for example, because I have a lifestyle of healthy eating, I, I eat mostly healthy food on Thanksgiving, but my, my mom's, uh, my family friend, she makes the best stuffing and I've had it every year since I was a kid. So that's just like my treat once a year. And, but because, you know, this past Thanksgiving, I had, I had, uh, sauteed Brussels sprouts. I had cauliflower mashed potatoes. I had turkey and then I had, you know, unhealthy stuffing, but I was able to do that because I, my mindset is it's a lifestyle and I'm able to indulge in those things because I take care of myself. So I want your listeners to think about like, 
it's not about being restricted because restriction leads to obsession. And that's number one is making sure that this is a lifestyle and not a diet. Um, no, I completely agree. I think it's really difficult to live in a hundred percent, like, you know, fully regimented, you know, completely, completely healthy foods. And I think, you know, I guess I guess it's really difficult to understand why, but you look at even like someone like The Rock. The Rock posts on his Instagram all the time. I think it's like once every two weeks, he has a giant cheat day. So like in his day, he will take down an entire box of pizza. He will take down, he'll make the most delicious waffles. And, you know, with syrup, he pulls out all the stocks. But at the same time, it's like, you know that he's living a great lifestyle, right? Like even though he's doing this one thing, that's not very healthy. He's eating healthily, you know, 29 out of 30 days, you know, around there. So I do, I do think it's really important not to really punish yourself. Right. Cause I think, I think that's the worst part, right. Punishing yourself for doing something bad, even though we're, we're naturally human, right. Like we're always going to have those little, I guess, like deviations, but it's not the end of the world. Absolutely. And there's something actually psychologically to having what are called intentional deviations. Um, I'm not sure if that's a scientific term, but it's, you get the gist of it. It's basically yeah. you plan when you're going to have an indulgent meal. Because when we plan for it, we're empowered. But when, like, ima- like this, like, imagine two different scenarios. Let's say uh, you, you're, you're, you're on this, uh, this diet and you've been, do- you've been really good lately. And then you're, you're tempted because you know, your family is, they don't eat as healthy as you. And so now they're having pizza tonight and you're like, oh, I really don't want it. And then all of a sudden you just cave in. That was an unintentional deviation. And then you start to feel really bad about yourself because it wasn't intended. But when you plan for it, it has a completely different psychological effect because now it's like, well, it was, I intended to. So I was the one that chose this. It wasn't because of my environment. It's because I chose it. And the research that I've seen shows that people that have planned indulgences versus unplanned indulgences, the ones that plan for it actually do better long-term. They actually stick with their lifestyle of eating more long-term compared to those that just fall off the wagon unintentionally. So, because they have that sense of control. Like even though yeah. they're doing it, first of all, it's not an impulsive decision, right? Because really the problems of eating too much or pretty much anything, right? Like anything that you don't wanna do, it's because you're struggling with your impulses. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're actually, and when you say planning, do you mean like you plan it like a day ahead or do you plan it? Like you're like, okay, you know what? I'll take my cheat meal right now. And then. Yeah. Uh, From what the research, it was, they planned it ahead of time. But as long as I would say, as long as you're actually planning it and you don't want to plan it, like, you know, every day at 12, I'm going to have this, (laughs) like that's different. (laughs) But like, you know, um, you know, once a month with my family, I'm going to indulge in pizza night with them because it's, it's just like a great opportunity to, to bond with them. Like, you know, it's a special thing. Um, but like, like you know, there's also, I know people that will say, you know, I only have ice cream once a week or I only have, uh, you know, brownies uh, on Monday nights. And, but they, their health isn't at a place where they want it to be. So there's definitely, there's a way, there's, a, there's an intelligent way of doing this and there's a not intelligent way of doing this. So Definitely need to be smart about it. Go ahead. Yeah, a lot of it's definitely common sense. Like, you know, it's just, you know, if you're doing something that you know you shouldn't be doing, then don't do it. You know, just try to try to keep off. I agree, try to keep off with the impulsive decision making. Because if you do anything that's really impulsive and rash, then it's like you're setting yourself up to psychologically, right? If you do something, you make a decision, and then you get a reward from it, which would be the unhealthy food, then Mm -hmm. you're you're going to do that more often. So if you say, Oh yeah, you know, let me do something impulsive. Then you get the reward right away. It's like the next time you're going to be incentivized to do something impulsive and it's going to be a spiral that keeps going downhill. Yes, exactly. So I think one awesome thing that you have is you have, you spent an entire man. I don't know how long it took you because I read through it. I thought they were incredible. You made an entire cookbook. What was the inspiration for this cookbook? And Honestly, like, what is so valuable about it? Is it, is it, does, is it very sound amongst all of your physiological principles? Yeah, so, yeah, and thank you. I'm glad you read through all of it. And uh, hopefully, or at some point, you get a chance to make some of them. Um, but yeah, what inspired me was I wanted, I, I don't know, whenever I go through cookbooks, I'm always disappointed. And I always find recipes that have too many ingredients or 
they aren't, um, they're not as clean or healthy as I like them to be. Um, so basically, yeah, I spent a, a few months putting this together and it's designed for busy moms. Mm. And it's designed for busy moms because, um, well, basically the, my, the, the, the group of people that I help is, uh, are moms and I'll, we can talk about that in a little bit too, if you want, why I do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's intended for busy moms. So moms are busy and moms that want to lose weight. So this cookbook needed to have uh, very simple recipes. It needed to have tasty recipes. It needed to have recipes that were going to keep our insulin levels down. So we're able to start burning the fat. Um, recipes that don't raise our blood sugar, um, recipes that have lots of good quality vegetables and healthy meats and, um, and um, you know, some good healthy fruits. And the other really important thing is I know so many moms, if they're trying to lose weight, they have to make one meal for themselves and then one for the family. Yeah. So that's just wasting more, that's spending more time. And they're less likely going to follow that plan because of it, they, it's so hard to sustain doing two meals like that. That's so, yeah. Yeah. And so what I intended was to make this so that I wanted the whole family to enjoy these recipes. So I put together recipes that weren't just designed for the moms. They were designed for mom, the kids, uh, more importantly, the kids, and then the spouse, of course. Interesting. Yeah. Did you find that uh, it was difficult to make a cookbook that was very, I'm assuming there's very little processed foods, because from what I read, there was very little processed foods. Right. Mm -hmm. And since our society is absolutely rampant with those, did you find that it was like incredibly difficult to do that? Um, well, yeah, I definitely took more of a whole food approach where if it, if it has, if the, the food itself, um, my, my motto is like the, the food you want to be eating, it should, it should only have one ingredient and that should be the food itself. So like, you know, the only ingredients in the cashew are cashews. The only ingredients in broccoli is broccoli, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I wanted, I found recipes and I put together recipes that were mainly whole food based because that's the kind of food that's going to help you be healthy and also lose the weight. Um, and also help the kids get healthier too, because you know, kids are so sick today and they need their mom to be a role model for what healthy eating is. So this cookbook is an opportunity for them to get healthier themselves, to get their kids healthier, and then just to be a better role model for their kids as well. Um, I love that. Okay. One more question about the cookbook. Cause I've yeah. been, I read it like three to four weeks ago and it's been like, the suspense has been absolutely killing me in the entire cookbook. You make all these, all these incredible meals, all these incredible dishes, zero of them have dairy. Why is that? <laughs> I know you asked me about that weeks ago and <laughs> wanted to save it for this. So yeah, I find like when it comes to dairy, so there's like two main components of it that are problematic for people. Uh, one is lactose and it's like some 60 to 70% of people 70 don't even have the enzyme to break down lactose. So if you can't break down lactose, you're going to get gas and bloating and diarrhea and those kinds of things. Um, so if you're somebody who is dealing with any kind of gut issue, dairy is typically the number one culprit that's going to go. Whether If you have a gut issue, an autoimmune issue, those are typically... Uh, dairy is the thing that I would say needs to go with most people, and I'll get into that. Um, well, do you find that people don't know if they're lactose intolerant because it's not a direct effect? Yeah, so if they're not lactose intolerant, there's also the pro so that's the sugar in milk is lactose. There's also mm -hmm. um, the protein called casein. And so casein is really the issue that might not necessarily show up as um, a gut issue. It might show up as a casein is very inflammatory for people. And so what casein can do is, so in our gut, we have what are called tight junctions. I'm gonna show it with my, my hands right here. So basically in our gut, it's a long, long tube. And what lines the tubes are, there's just like a single cell thick that goes all around the entire tube. And normally our, our, um, our gut wall is basically, it has cells that are really close together like this. Um, and that's good because we don't want to be allowing undigested food getting through our gut into our bloodstream because then it's going to cause a lot of issues. But what happens is a lot of people experience what's called leaky gut, which means the cell, the, the cells that are lining our gut, they actually open up a little bit. So now undigested protein, undigested food, uh, and bacteria from our gut can leak into our bloodstream and that causes really? so many issues. Like, so is that process, is that like waste food or is that like food that has been already digested? 
So yeah, it'll be food. It'll be mainly like food and, and mainly proteins that are not fully digested because uh, our, you know protein is fully digested in our gut. And if we have leaks in our gut, um, and it's very small, it's very microscopic. It's not like this huge thing where you know it's just <laughs> just seeping Most into our parts of the Red Sea. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very small, but it's small enough. Uh, it's big enough to let mainly undigested protein through. And so our immune system responds to foreign proteins. So what happens when our body sees foreign proteins is it actually attacks it and that leads to an inflammatory response. Yeah. And what inside our own bloodstream. Mm-hmm. Wow. And and leaky gut is implicated as like a root cause of most, if not all, autoimmune diseases. So um, and autoimmune just meaning the body attacking itself. And just to get back to casein, so casein is the protein in, in milk and cheese and yogurt, cottage cheese, and casein is inflammatory in the gut and it can cause more leaky gut symptoms. So that's big problem with, with, with cow products. So it's inflammatory and we have a hard time breaking it down. So inflammation is a root cause of, of hormonal imbalances, of difficulty losing weight. If we have inflammation in our body, that actually affects our insulin. So then our body can't respond as well to insulin. And then we put on more weight. So we need, if we want to lose weight and get healthy and balance our hormones, we need to keep the, the inflammation down. And that's going to come from avoiding foods like casein. Uh, not everyone is sensitive to casein. Um, but I would say if you are someone who just, you know, loves your dairy products, uh, sheep and goat tip are, uh, tend to be less problematic for people. So, and then if you are going to have cows products, make sure it's organic because you do not want to have all the pesticides of the, you know, what the cows are eating. You want to make sure your dairy products are, are organic and you want to stick to the, the more fat, the better, which is probably contrary to what a lot of people believe, like the skim and the 1%, it's usually higher in sugar, which is the big problem with, uh, you know, putting on weight. So, um, but yeah, that's why my, my cookbook doesn't have dairies because it's inflammatory for a lot of people and I'm trying to lower inflammation for people so that an inflammation, I guess, is indicated in a whole bunch of diseases, including cancer, including heart disease, weight gain, autoimmune disease, um, yeah. and brain fog, all this stuff. Well, that was why, that was why actually I just pulled out a book that me and you had a conversation about before called The Pleasure Trap by mm -hmm. Douglas J. Lyle and Alan Goldheimer. I absolutely love this book. I recommended it to my mom and my mom actually read it. And mm -hmm. right now, if you take a look at the book, it is absolutely destroyed because she put it in the washing machine on accident. <laughs> I can't explain how that happened. But <laughs> I know, but, but one, of the best, one of the most interesting things that I read in that book was that they said casein is one of the most, uh, one of the leading causes of cancer. And it's like, how is that possible? And I think it has to do a large part with the inflammation, right? Like when you have all this inflammation in your body and your body is essentially fighting against itself, which is really, really scary. So, yeah. Yeah. So one question I do have that I think the thing that it's the thing that really gets me because, you know, we have an entire system, right? So let's say I get a cut on my hand. If I get a cut on my hand, I'm going to feel that pain right away. I'm going to understand it. But our gut, our, you know, our stomach is so complex that it's like, we, first of all, we don't know where that sort of, if we have inflammation inside of there, we don't know where it came from, which is a problem. And then at the same time, we don't know what's causing it, right? So there's so many things that are going on. Do you find that something like dairy, something like, you know, all these inflammatory substances are causing a problem that we don't even know about? Yeah, like a lot of people aren't, because people have been having their food for so long and they're used to feeling a certain way for so long that they it's just normal to them at this point. Yeah. So they don't know how good they could be feeling. Like they don't know what it's like feeling better than they do right now. And one really powerful way of, of figuring out for yourself, it's a really simple way, figuring out for yourself if, if, if a certain food is a problem for you is you just remove that food entirely 100%. There's no 99%. There's 100% removal. Um, oh, of a certain food for let's call it three weeks typically is what I do and you remove it for three weeks and then you just you know note how you feel and then at the end of the three weeks you reintroduce that food and typically if you are sensitive to you will notice it at the end of three weeks and like people get such remarkable improvements when they go through that process that's called an elimination 
diet. Um, basically, you remove problematic foods three weeks or four weeks and reintroduce one at a time. And the thing is, if you're testing gluten and, and dairy, you don't reintroduce pizza because it's both, right? Because then you're, you're not, if, you get, if you feel like crap, you're not going to know what caused it. So you, you reintroduce one food at a time and you also want to reintroduce it for three consecutive days. So let's say um, I removed dairy for 21 days. And now all right, so I'm, I had it today. Um, I had it with breakfast, let's say. Um, I'm going to have it today. And then I, I don't notice any symptoms. I'm going to have it tomorrow. Still no symptoms. And then day three, I'm going to have it again. And if I still have no symptoms, then it's okay for me to eat. But the thing with, yeah, the thing with these foods though, is that they're called food sensitivity. So you can have a food today and it might not cause an issue for you until 48 hours later. So that's why you want to give it those three days because um, you can react up to 72 hours later. So that's called an elimination diet. And the, the most problematic foods for people that cause inflammation are going to be gluten, dairy, um, eggs can be a problem for some people. Um, soy can be a problem for people. And, um, and also those are the main ones I would say. Yeah. I, can call I, just, I just think that's so interesting because, you know, we have an entire system set up in our, in our body. Right now, if I have, for example, if I'm the traditional lactose intolerant, let's say, if I'm, which I'm not, if I'm the traditional lactose intolerant, right, I'm going to be, my stomach's going to hurt like three hours later, and I'm going to be, I'm going to tell right away. I'm going to be like, okay, you know what, that was from the dairy, that's a problem. But if it happens 48 to 72 hours later, like that's insane, because what, what person is going to go and be like, oh yeah, you know, it's definitely because of the dairy that I had two and a half days ago, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that I think that's incredibly difficult. And what I notice is the problem because I actually quit dairy a while ago for a different reason, just because of the way that they treat the cows. We don't have to get into it, but it's just incredibly. Yeah. I, I just, for some reason, like after I after I watched the videos and you know after I read all about it, I was like, I can't have this anymore. But it turns out it's a good good reason because thank God. And <laughs> the thing that I notice when I talk to people about it is they'll say. Obviously, you know, they're not hearing it from a doctor, right? You're a doctor, I'm not a doctor. But, you know, if, if someone, if I tell it to someone, they'll just be like, you think I'm going to give up ice cream for, you know, I tell them my whole life. But I think for, for some people saying for three weeks, you're going to let me, you're going to make me give up ice cream, cheese, milk, you know? But I think when you have someone like a doctor, right, coming, coming onto this podcast and saying, you know what, this is something that is super important. It causes real problems. And at the same time, it could, you know, you might not even know that these are the problems that it causes. So giving it up for three weeks, even as just an experiment on yourself, is something that's incredibly valuable. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No. Great experiment. It's, I think everyone should, should do it. You know, of course, talk to your doctor about doing it. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's so important to, to give that a try because like so many people do not know that they're walking around feeling like crap because they have these food sensitivities that they're eating every single day and they just feel like crap and they, they just think it's part of aging, which it's, it's not true. Yeah, that kills. I mean, I think that's something that's just characteristic of our whole society, right? Like if you have 40% of people who are obese, then you might assume that, oh yeah, you know, just as we get older, we get more, more fat. But at the same time, it's like, you look at 200 years ago, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think, you know, looking from it from that perspective is, is really, really awesome. One thing I did want to talk to you about, just switching gears a little bit, and we talked about this a little bit before, but you know, I I sort I sort of believe that you as a doctor do so much more than the average doctor, right? Like most people do like one-on-one -on -one consultations and things like that. You have your own cookbook, you create your own course, you also do one-on-one -on -one sessions, and you have such a tribe, such a passion that comes from it. And part of it is all actually i would say most of it is driven by your purpose right so i'd love to hear your story about what happened with your mother and also why you want to why most of your target clients are newborn mothers yeah that's yeah great um yeah so basically uh with my mom my story with her is so back in my mom she's 56 now and she for her whole life you know never exercised really uh, ate okay she she would think she ate healthy um, I knew differently, but she thought she ate healthy, so she continued to do that because she didn't have any problems. You know, she was thin. She um, really didn't have any aches or pains. She thought she was healthy. So she thought health 
was a lack of symptoms, basically, which is not true. Um, because, you know, dead people don't have symptoms, but they're not healthy. It's and, true. I mean, health, health brings energy, right? So, I mean, if you're putting good stuff into your body, you're going to have more energy. That's just sort of how it is. And even if you're skinny, you still might not have that much energy because you're putting crap in your body. Yeah, exactly. And so she thought she was healthy. So therefore, why would she make any changes? And so most of her life, you know, she just continued going like that. And then December of 2019, she had a huge wake up call. And, you know, she had a biopsy of her breast, you know, she gets her mammograms every year. And then, you know, they found breast cancer. And that, so that was beginning or end of last year, beginning of this year, you know, she started chemotherapy in February. And it was just like the hardest few months um, yeah. cause I was still living, uh, I was back in New York with her, um, helping take care of her. And it's just like the hardest thing in the world to have to take care of your own parent because they didn't truly take care of themselves for the years leading up to that. And so just like seeing her struggle through that, it just really woke something up in me that, you know, no kid should ever have to you know, take care of their parent. No kid should ever have to wonder if their parent is going to be able to be at their wedding no kid should ever have to you know wonder if they're going to lose their mom too soon yeah. and and so like I mean, those thoughts were going through my head she was suffering with the chemo and it was just so hard to see her go through it and you know she's she's okay now like she's cancer free which is awesome um and she's she's doing a little better with her lifestyle it's just she I'm, I'm noticing some old tendencies come up um, which is you know, unfortunate. I'm, when I go home, I'm, I'm going to talk some sense into her some more. But basically, that, what that all has to do with my purpose is I, I know that moms are like the foundation of the, the household. And I know if you, know, you, the mom, you don't feel good, you have no energy, you have no self confidence, you don't like how your clothes fit, like you just have all these different problems going on. It's like, how can you possibly show up and be the best version of self, yourself for your kids? How can you be the, you know, my motto is I want you to be the hero for your kids. And part of being a hero is like having the energy, feeling good about yourself, being able to just keep up with your kids at the, play, at the park instead of just sitting on the bench, watching them play from the sidelines. And, you know, you want to be the fun mom. And it's just hard to do that if you're not taking care of yourself, if you're not eating right, if you're not sleeping right. If you're, if you're not managing your stress properly, if you don't have your mindset straight. So basically I, my mission is to help moms because I know that you guys are the foundation of the household and I want you to be there for your kids. Like I want my mom to be there for me for as long as possible. I want you to be there for your kids for as long as possible and actually get to enjoy your life and not just, you know, go through life. And like so many people do as they get older and they just, they're not living their life for the last 15 years. They're just, they're, they're on medications. They, they're, their joints hurt. They can't travel. They can't do things on their bucket list. So I want to help you live life to its fullest and just create amazing memories with your kids. So that's really how I got into this. And that's why I created the course and the cookbook and, the, and why I do the one-on-ones because I want to help. I want to help you be a hero for your kids. That's something that I find so incredible because, you know, when you have something like, when you talk about, you know, these things that may happen and are more likely to happen when you work on a bad diet, such as, you know, the cancers and the joint pains and all those things, you know, those sort of later in life problems, those are also super, those are incredibly important. But another thing that you brought up that I think is so incredible is just having more energy, right? Like if you put good food into your body, like if you, if you treat your body like a machine, then you'll just have more energy on the daily to just you know, spend time with your kids, make more friends, like do, you know, pursue work in a better way. And I think that's just part of what, you know, as we get older, and you, you sort of said this, right? Like, as you get older, you feel like, oh, part of it is like, you feel like, because you're getting older, you're going to lose a little bit of energy. But that, that gets exponentialized, right? When that's probably not a word, but anyways, <laughs> they probably, you know, it, it gets ramped up so much, because then you have something like, eating bad foods, right? Like you eat worse foods as you get older and then your energy starts to deplete even more. And it's like, it not only affects something that might happen in the future, but it also affects your day-to-day life. And I think that's something that you do that's incredible just being able to help mothers yeah. who especially, you know, are just spending time with their kids sort of get back into it and be a good parent. Yeah, absolutely. And just to quickly go back to like the energy thing and the food, it's like 
you wouldn't put canola oil in your your car engine like yeah. it, you know that's not going to help the engine function optimally it's like why do we put that crap in our bodies because it's not going to help us function optimally and we're not going to have the energy to do these things that we love and um you know something that I, we spoke about this last time and i wanted to bring it up quickly is um you know i help moms most moms they come to me because they want to lose weight and so I help them lose weight, but I have like a, I have a hidden agenda of, I want to help them lose weight, but like what I'm going to give you what you want, but I'm also going to give you what you need and help you actually get healthier, help your body heal and lower the inflammation, get healthier. Even though it's not necessarily what you directly want, that's going to be a result of, of our work together is that you, you're going to lose the weight, but you're also going to get healthier because you can lose weight in unhealthy ways. You can lose weight and get unhealthy and that's not sustainable. So I help you yeah. lose weight and get healthier. At the I think, time. I think it's something. I mean, you mean you are very similar, very similar. Because yeah. I have the same thing, right? So my whole thing is I'm writing a book that's you know sort of helping people get rid of their bad habits, but I'm also trying to make them. You know, you're trying to say heroes of the household. I'm trying to make them heroes of their own life, right? You know, these are more people going into the mature age, and they want to be heroes going into their twenties, and that's what ends up happening. I think it's it's funny because you bring up the archetype of the hero and part of the archetype of the hero you imagine almost every single hero right every single movie that you've ever seen when you talk about heroes they never sought it out right like you imagine luke skywalker you know that's that's the famous scene you know r2d2 just happens to run into luke skywalker and then you know there's the scene of uh prince leia saying help me obi-wan kenobi you're my only hope right and then he he finds out that obi-wan kenobi used to be uh used to be a, um, a Jedi, right? And all these amazing things, but he never sought it out, right? You look at almost every, every movie, it's not meant to, you're not meant to seek it out. It's meant to catch you, right? It's meant to find you. The hero's journey is meant to find you. And I think what you do is so awesome because you're seeking them out and nobody's gonna really seek it, seek it out. You know, it's not gonna be as popular if people are saying, you know, I want you to be a hero. I want you to be a mom hero. You know, people aren't going to be, they're not going to be willing to pay for it. You know, they're not going to be willing to dedicate their time to it, like all these things. But when, when it sort of catches you in this way, right? When, when it just kind of finds you, then you, you know, that's part of accepting the hero's journey. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a journey and like part of a journey, there's ups and downs. And so there's a sign back here that says progress over perfection. And like, that's part of the hero's journey, in my opinion. It's, there's, you know, when people go, through, you know, when I work with people, when they do my course or whatever, uh, it's, I never expect perfection from them because that's unattainable. So it's just about this, the mindset is, you know, this is not um, an all or nothing kind of thing. It's, I'm going to do my best. And I'm, if I quote unquote fall off the very next meal, the very next day, I'm going to get right back on. And it's, yeah. so it's, yeah, it's, I don't, I don't ask for perfection. That's just part of the journey. There's going to be some some struggles and that's okay that's that's normal it's expected any time there you're going after something worthwhile yeah i agree and i think i think one of the most important points in that is in the beginning right when you begin to accept your hero's journey and when you start to accept you know what i'm going to be a better mom for my kids or you know any 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 type of goal right any type of goal that you're really going for part of it is when you are the person who has accepted the hero's journey, you must realize that you're not the type of person that, that has the ability to succeed. You have to be able to grow within that. So the person that you are now will not be the same person that you will be after you quit. And that's on purpose, right? We're trying to help you grow and to achieve that progress. Because if you don't, the person that you are now is not going to be able to quit, right? Like they'll be able to start the process. But to get you through that journey, it really does require that shift in that mindset, you know, the acceptance of, you know, the responsibility of, you know what, I'm going to be a great mom. And mm -hmm. that, that really allows for someone to grow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah no, I think, I think, I just think it's absolutely incredible doing all these things. So another question that I wanted to, um, that I want to spin off of that was, what do you find sort of happens in these mothers, right? So when you're mostly consulting with, with moms, do you find that they sort of, they accept it willingly or do you find that there's a lot of, you know, hesitation to really go and accept it? No, I feel like cause they, a lot of, a lot of them are just kind of fed up with where they are and they just, they want something different. You know, they've tried the diets, they've tried 
these short term fixes and they just, they want something different and they know that if they want different results, they need to do something differently. And so, you know, they, what happens is just like they have more energy to just be a mom and they get to just, um, they just feel like they're able to be the mom their kids really need. And like before, they struggled with their energy and they just, they couldn't really connect with their kids and they it just, they didn't get to live life with them. And now it's like, they get to be able to do so much more with them. And it's just, that's so fulfilling to them. And that's like their purpose. And they just want to be able to connect and enjoy their time with their kids. Cause it's going to go by so fast. And so they've, you know, it's, they're the hero and they're, they've been able to take what they've learned and, and stick with it. And it's just, it's beautiful to see like these, you know, the transformations of, of moms and, and just how much better they feel about themselves, like their confidence and their ability to have their, their energy so they can do the things that they want with their kids and their spouse, of course. I agree. I think there's one important piece that we have been missing though. And I think, you know, every time we talk about doing things, like it's all well and good, but at the same time, a big part of it is, you know, the sort of irrational side of us, the part of us where we really can't control ourselves. You know, a big part of the reason why people don't, people don't quit in the first place is because they're like, you know, this fulfills this sort of, you know, impulsive drive that I have. You know, I want to eat more food because after all, who doesn't like cake? You know, who doesn't like, you know, sugar, right? It's, it's actually somewhat addictive. So what do you, what do you recommend for the people who are, you know, trying to, trying to sort of, I guess, quit you know, if you're saying it's sort of like an addiction standpoint, right? They're trying to quit these unhealthy foods, but at the same time, they struggle due to their impulses. Yeah, so there's a couple of things I do in my course to help. Um, basically, I, I, the beginning of the course is like the whole thing is dedicated to our mindset. And mm -hmm. like the very first thing I have people do is they, they basically write out, you know, one year from now, like, who do I want to be? Like, what does my life look like? They, they create a compelling future because if they – if they're just, if their goal is, you know, just to lose weight, that's just not compelling enough. It's, it's really not, it's too superficial to actually motivate somebody. Um, and then also they're motivated by, by pain. So they're motivated by the pain of their weight, but once they lose the weight, what happens to the motivation? Now it's gone. So the things yeah. they did to lose the weight, they're going to stop doing those things because they, they, their motivation was caused by or was um, prompted by something that was too superficial. So what I have them do is they, they write out there, it's called like, a, you can call it a January letter or just like a, you know, a one year from now, they write back as if they were one year in the present or in the future from now. And they write back, they, they write reflecting back on the, the previous year that they just had, how amazing it was. So, you know, let's say what's, today is the 31st of 2020. So I would say, all right, so today is, uh, August 31st, 2021. And it's been such an incredible year. And here's why, like all these things, like I've been able to play with my kids. Like I have more energy now. Um, I love who I see in the mirror. I, my clothes fit so much more. I can finally wear that sexy dress that my, you know, that my, my spouse loves when I wear it. Um, so that's the first thing is I have them paint that big vivid picture. The second thing I have them do is, um, I got this from Dean Graziosi, if you know him, yeah. but he has an exercise called the seven, uh, um, seven levels deep of why. So like, you know, what's your, your first goal is I want to lose weight. Okay. Why? And they say, you know, whatever it is. And I, and I have them go through like seven different reasons of why until they get to like this really emotional reason why, because it, it starts more superficial and then it comes down getting way deeper and way more emotional. So that's the second piece of the puzzle. Because oh, so, so it starts with why do you want to lose weight? And then you the give your answer. And then it just keeps saying, why, why, yeah. why? Because I want to fit into my dress. Okay, why do you want to fit into your dress? And they keep going until they get to this really, and like around the answers five, six, or seven is where they really get emotion. it like hits the emotional part. And like, that's the reason that is going to motivate you long-term. So you start out like with a superficial thing, I want to lose weight. And then it gets to this like, you know, I just, I don't want to regret looking back at my life and, and seeing like how much I wasted my time because I wasn't yeah. didn't feel good. So they get to a really emotional, um, you know, reason. So, cause like, uh, we spoke about this before, but like if people want to quit, the, like if they want to quit these harmful foods, it's just not enough to, like we spoke about, it, it's not just enough to have it out of the house, which, which is helpful, 
but it's, that's not enough. Like you need to change right. your identity. You need to change how you see yourself because if, if you believe you are who you've always, like if you believe that you're going to be who you've always been, you're going to continue to do the things that you've always done. So like they have to have the compelling future. They have to change how they see themselves. They have to really shift their mindset if they want long-term results. And that's why I started the course like that. So I started with their mindset. Um, and then are you familiar with the implementation habits? Have you heard that phrase before? In, no, I have not. So it's basically like, it's a if, if and then statement. So um, if I'm craving um, something sweet at night, then I, I have some peppermint tea or something like that. So it's oh, basically course, yeah. a, an antis, it's like your, your, cre your, it's, oh, sorry, an implementation intention is what it's called. And so you're setting your intention um, for when this certain craving comes up. So like, if I crave something, then I will blank. Um, and it's basically what's the, the disempowering action that's going to happen. Like, oh, well, you know, I have something really sweet and unhealthy. And if that craving comes up, then I will blank, you know, I'll go on a walk. I'll call a friend. I will X, whatever it is. Like, so that's just the same thing for me. I did push-ups. I was like, Oh, I'll, I'll do push-ups. And by the time you're done with the push-ups, right. By hopefully by the time you're done with whatever exercise it is, it resets your brain. You're, you're not craving that. Thing anymore. Yep, exactly. Um, and that's another one. It's like, you can do an uh, implementation intention for exercising. So like, um, it's a funny way of wording it, but like, or it could be like, when I wake up, then I, I, I drop on the ground and do, you know, 10 pushups or, um, when I wake up, I drink water. So it's just like, you're, you're setting the intention of what you're going to do at a certain like location and time. Just super powerful. Very powerful. Yeah. I think it's awesome. I do think it's awesome. So, so is that, okay. First of all, I, I would like to hear more about your course, but at the same time, I don't, I don't want to get any spoilers, right? You know, I don't want any people taking it. So if you don't want to tell more about your course, then that's cool. But at the same time, I do think your course is incredibly interesting, especially from the start. Yeah, I'll just, I can give like a brief overview. And um, so basically it's a, an eight week long course and it's intended to teach moms how to lose the weight, but also lose the weight in a way that's more of a lifestyle and not some sort of fad diet that you just, you, you stop doing it, um, you know, in a few weeks or months. So I teach all about nutrition. I teach a very simple fitness plan, you know, 20 minutes, no more than 20 minutes, three times per week. So very effective, simple workout routine, like no treadmills, no run, uh, going to the gym, which is perfect because, you know, COVID. So it, all the workouts are done at home. Um, so, so simple nutrition plan, a simple workout routine. I teach about sleep and like, what are the things that hurts our sleep and how do we, how do we fix those so we can get better quality sleep? Because, um, the research shows that when people don't sleep well, if they don't get enough sleep or enough quality sleep, they're going to put on weight. They're going to develop insulin resistance. They're more likely to have heart disease or diabetes. So sleep is super important. So it's not just, I don't teach, I don't have you guys, I don't have you cut calories in this. I don't have you do that because it's just too simplistic. There needs to be a, a holistic approach. We need to address, um, of course, nutrition. We need to address the fitness. We need to address sleep. I have a whole, um, uh, module on creating a, a solid morning routine because so many people start their day on social media or watching the news. And so if you, have, if you're already off to a, a negative mindset from the beginning of the day, you're not going to make the best possible healthy choices for yourself because your mindset's off. So I teach you, I teach like a step-by-step -step morning routine so that moms can have, so basically when you have a solid morning routine, which I'm sure you have a morning routine as well. Um, you're like, you're in a much more positive mindset. You, you have a more positive outlook on the world. You have more energy and you just, you're more focused and you're more productive. Um, I find that the best part about it. So per personally, what I do, and I find it super simple, super easy. You wake up in the morning. First thing you do, take a walk, right? Mm -hmm. Just take a simple walk. I leave my phone in my room, right? I don't need it, right? Like, why would I need my phone? You know, it's, it's not that urgent. I take a walk. And all I do is I just admire nature. Like I, I bring myself into, uh, into consciousness essentially, right? So I just, I just woke up from being unconscious 
now I'm starting my day, and I'm starting my day with the beautiful world instead of my beautiful or not even close to beautiful phone, right? So mm-hmm. something as simple as that, like I just find that not only are you not starting yourself off in a negative way, but at the same time, you're starting yourself off on a non-impulsive way, right? So, you know, if you start your day off on skills for media, you know, you, you start your day off on email, you're, you're already dealing with these sort of like, um, I guess, manufactured feelings that social media companies are trying to give to you, email companies, you know, they're trying to make you stay on their app for as long as you can. And that's true with email. It's the same thing with a variable reward schedule, right? Which is a psychological term for you might get ha- you might get a interesting email at any time. So when you're doing that, you're really not in control over your actions. But when you just take a simple walk in the morning or, you know, just do anything mindful, I find that to be absolutely incredible. Yeah, absolutely. And like, just to piggyback off that, like if you're on social media and something, you, you get some negative emotion, that's, that's a stressor. And what does stress do? It raises cortisol. What does cortisol do? It actually, it inhibits like our, the, the front of our brain that's involved in willpower. So now we have less willpower and what happens? We're going to end up, we're less likely to, or we're more likely to then indulge in something that's not going to be as healthy. So it's like, it's not just about counting calories. It, it's this holistic approach where like, if you, if you don't start your morning right and you're more stressed, you, then you're going to eat more uh, harmful foods and that's going to put on more weight. So we need to look at the entire aspect of things, not just, oh, how many calories does this have? Okay. So it's... Yeah. Well, you said that in the beginning, right? So your whole purpose is to address the root of the problem. And that's something that I think is incredibly awesome, right? When we have our doctor system today, I, I understand the whole financial implications, but if I were to think of a perfect system, right? The perfect system would be preventative doctors, right? Like the perfect system would be, you know, not getting obese in the first place, like 42% of Americans are, and figuring out what you could do when you put on that extra, you know, 10, 20 pounds and you're like, you know what, I need to, I need to fix myself instead of doing it after you need to go and see a big doctor who gets paid $250,000 a year to treat people who have already become obese. Mm -hmm. So, so something, something as simple as your course, which, you know, is less than the incredible medical bill that you're going to have to pay, right? Yeah. Like yeah. whenever you do something like that, it's just absolutely incredible to be able to change your lifestyle instead of being given some sort of, you know, crisis measure that a doctor is going to give you after you have been, you know, given a diabetes mm-hmm. um, sentence or anything like that. Yeah, it's definitely our our medical system is is reactive and not um, proactive. Which, if you want to be in control, this has to do with like it's kind of the same thing with your morning routine. Do you start your day off reactive and, and checking social media and just being kind of influenced by what people are throwing at you, or do you want to be proactive and decide? You know, I'm going to go for my walk today, and I'm not going to bring my phone. I'm going to determine how I feel today. I'm not going to let the world tell me how I feel. So we need to be proactive with our health. And that means doing things differently. That means um, stepping outside the box and trying something different. Because if you keep trying the same calorie counting model over and over and over again, you're, and you're not getting results, like try something different because it's clearly not working and it's not the best approach. Um, and one last thing in the course is I, I do have a bonus on grocery shopping and how do you effectively read mm-hmm. labels. So, because you want to know what you're putting into your body and the labels are most people, they look at the front of the, of the, uh, the product and what's the front of the label intended to do. It's intended. To, it's like, that's the marketing there. It's intended to help want, make you want to buy that thing. But what you need to do is every, every, whenever you grab something, it's just turn it around and look at the label. And I teach you, it's like the only way you look at the ingredients. That's the number one way to know whether or not the food is going to be healthy, promoting health promoting or disease promoting. So it's not the calories it's not the fat it's not the the protein look at the ingredients first like that's the number one thing when it comes to reading labels um but i have a whole module on that there's this book that i'm reading by uh nate andorsky right now it's called decoding the why and actually i I really did like this book by nate andorsky i you know just very incredible and essentially when he says decoding the why he actually looks at it from a product design perspective, right? So he's actually trying to talk to the people who are creating, you know, the the marketing labels. So I find it interesting to look at it from that perspective. And his Hmm. advice, and I thought this was so interesting, his advice was, if you're selling ice cream, they did a study, and I, you know, I'm not going to be able to find it in there at the (laughs) moment, but the study was, 
if you label, if you put your ice cream and you say 80% fat free on the label, people are going to go nuts for it. But if you say 20% fat, no, nobody's into it. It's the same exact thing, but people don't go for it. Exactly. Yeah. So the labels, it's just, they're, they're designed to make you want to buy their product. So like in the same thing, people see, Oh, the, this food is gluten free. Uh, it must be healthy. That's not true. <laughs> uh, cause gluten-free products can have tons of sugar, can have tons of other processed carbs. Um, so yeah, you really, you can't just fall for the, the that's really interesting. That study, I've never heard that before. It's, it makes sense. I mean, um, I'll tell you it down below. It's so interesting. Yeah. So cool. interesting. No, there was, oh, so there was one thing that I thought was super interesting that I'm, I'm actually very interested about. So when you say that you give a lifestyle plan in our society, it's very, I feel like whenever someone says, I'm going to go to the gym, you know, I've, I've done this multiple times throughout my life. I'm like, I'm going to go to the gym. And what ends up happening is I say, I'm going to go for an hour a day. I'm going to drive all the way to the gym, go for an hour a day, and then come all the way back. And that takes up an hour 20 of my day. And at the same time, it's very energy training. And I think, so what my, I'm, I actually have a podcast coming out soon. It's with uh, John Morin. He's, he's, he's actually, uh, he's known as XZ Zach on YouTube. And he's creating an app right now, which I find so incredibly interesting. The app is called Dojo. And all it is, is it incentivizes you to work out for 10 to 20 minutes every day. Or 10 to 20 minutes for a small period of time, like not that often. And I find it so interesting because we have this stigma of saying, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to burn all this energy going to the gym. I'm going to do it in one big burst and I'm going to have to do it every single time. But what I found is my most consistent times whenever I worked out, is when I do push-ups in the morning mm -hmm. or when I do pull-ups in the morning, you know, I would just a quick pull-up bar. It takes me 10 to 20 minutes. So I sort of agree with you, but I'm wondering why you recommend three times for 20 minutes. Is it scientifically supported to go there for three, uh, working out three days a week for 20 minutes instead of going to the gym and going on treadmills and left goes and things of that sort? Yeah. So I wanted to give them, so the, basically the kind of workouts that I give them are, it's called metabolic resistance training, um, which is a combination of high intensity interval training and um, resistance training. So those are the two types of workouts that actually burn fat uh, after you're done working out. Whereas like cardio, cardio is great for your heart and your brain and everything. And it's, it's important. Um, but I wanted to make this because I wanted to make this a lifestyle you have to start small. You can't just have, it's so easy to have these grand, like I'm going to do an hour every single day. And then it's like, well, that's, I'm, I don't want to do an hour. Therefore I'm going to do nothing, which is usually yeah. what happens. To a lot of people is we have this all or nothing kind of thought process, which I know I, I have, I have that too. Um, but like that all or nothing thought process is, is harmful because what if you just said, well, you know, I can't do an hour, but what if I just did like, you know, a minute Yeah, is a minute better than zero. Yeah. So, and it creates the lifestyle, it creates the habits, right? Exactly. And the thing that, um, that I really love from the book atomic habits is you have to, the number one thing you have to change is your identity. So if you have to, you need to become somebody who works out if you want to consistently work out. Yeah. So like my identity is I am somebody who eats healthy and it is, it has just become so, so easy for me to eat healthy. It's like not even, it's because it's just how I've identified myself as for so long. Um, that's just who I am. You know, this is just what I do. I eat healthy. Like, that's how important how we see how our, we uh, view ourselves is. So the type of workout I recommend is scientifically um, validated as like the best kind of working out to burn fat. Um, the time, the time, the amount of time is more. Uh, I chose that because it's more practical than necessarily scientifically proven. Um, so like 20 minutes is like, we all have an hour every single week, basically like somebody yeah. can find an hour in a week. And I love this from, I forgot her name, but she talks with Laura Vanderkam. She talks about how we oh, all have 168 hours in a week. So if we sleep for eight hours a night and we work, let's say a 50 hour work week, we have like, I think it's 70, I think 70 hours of time that's where we're not working and where we're not sleeping. So it's like, can you, one of those 70 hours, can you find one hour in your, in your whole week? And the, the, the honest thing is, and people have to get honest with themselves when they say, I don't have the time. They, what they really need to say is it's just not a priority to me. Cause that's the, that, yeah. that is 
truth. You know, that's the hard truth. And, you know, people need to hear that because otherwise they're going to, they're going to BS themselves and they're not going to get healthy and like, it's not acceptable. So well, instead of awesome. saying, no, yeah. I think it's awesome that you're just breaking, you're breaking the sort of stereotype. You know, if somebody says, I'm going to go work out and, you know, I'm going to have to tell my mom after this because she does 10,000 steps a day, you know, 10,000 steps a day, which is like insane. But that's, that's the thing. It's either like you're on the train or you're not. And it's like, when you say, you know, 72 hours and you only have one, you only have one hour. Most people think they're like, no, I have to do eight hours. I have to do 10 hours. How am I supposed to waste 10 hours of my, I'm not going to say waste, but I'm not willing to put in 10 hours a day. It's like, no, just put in one. Right. And so as long as you put in one, that's it. I agree. And I'm going to do the math for you right now, just so we have the, so we have the math. Um, so if you work, so we have 168 hours in a week. If you work for 50, which is probably being way over generous, yeah. uh, then you sleep for 56 hours a week. You have 62 hours left over where you're not working and not sleeping. So wow. there, two hours imagine that. Imagine that, right? You spend 30 hours a week watching TV. You spend 20 hours a week with your son or your daughter. And at the same time, you still have 12 hours left. 12. Exactly. And yep. So like the two big mindset things are, it's not all or nothing. Like you said, it that, it doesn't have to be 10,000 or zero. It can be, you can go on a five minute walk. It's just like, it's all about reinforcing that you are somebody who goes on walks. So if you're walking for, uh, you know, five minutes, you're still reinforcing that. It's just not as long, but you're like, you know, I don't have that much. Um, actually, I like saying instead of, I don't have the time. I like saying, how can I make the time? Mm. So how, so there's like all these little mindset things. It's like, um, how do I find the time? and Instead of saying it's, I, it's not, um, what did I say before? It, it's just not important to me. Oh, if, yeah. Like that's the truth because you, if there is a leak, if you're, you know, you had a leak in your basement and like it was flooding, would you just be like, ah, you know, I just don't have the time to deal with that right now. Yeah. No, you, you would find the time cause it's an emergency and, and you had, there's some urgency there. So we need to treat our health with some urgency. Like, no, I need to make this a priority. It needs to be a priority. And how do we make it a priority? We schedule it in. Like, we schedule it in just like, you know, if you had a, an appointment with your, for your daughter or your son at the doctor's office, would you, would you just not show up? Or for yourself, would you just not show up? And you would show up. You're going to go to the office because it's an appointment. So why are we breaking our appointments to ourselves? And, like, so we need to have, we need to make it a priority by putting it in our calendar, yeah, in our phone, and, like, it needs to be, um, what's it called? Like just really honored and making sure that you, you commit to that. And if you can't I, do the full 30 minutes, like do, do 10 minutes. Yeah, I think that's, I think, so two things on that. First of all, I think that's a great analogy. Like you have, you, you have a leak in your basement. It's like, no, you have a leak going on inside of you at all times if you're not eating healthy, right? Exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah, metaphorical leak. It could actually be a gut leak, like, like you were saying before, or mm -hmm. it could just be all the inflammation that's going on inside of you, the fact that your insulin isn't working properly. Like all these things are happening to you. It's essentially like your body is leaking. You just can't see it, so you just don't know about it. But at the same time, your health, your health, is, your health is leaking out of you. You're losing your health. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you know what, imagine, imagine it, imagine your body, like it's your physical house. And it's like, if you started to notice that a floorboard was coming down a little bit, you know, or there was some problem, some little structural problem that was happening. It's like, you, you'd start to take notice. It's like, we got to start doing that to ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. And another thing that I, that I wanted to point out that I thought was so interesting. So there's this sort of, you know, psychology that goes into five more minutes, right? Like when we talk about that, when you think of five more minutes, you think of, actually, it's a great analogy because we're talking about moms and their children. If I'm, when I was younger, I used to play video games all the time with my friends and my mom would call me, she'd be like, hey, Nick, you got to come. And I'll be like, mom, five more minutes, <laughs> five more minutes. And when I said five more minutes, she would be like, okay. Right? She would actually be like, okay. She actually was okay with it. And then what would happen, I would take 10 minutes, I'd take 15 minutes, and I'd push the boundaries. But if I told her up front, if I told her, mom, just give me 15 minutes, right? She'd be like, no, get, you, get your butt upstairs and <laughs> we're going. So I think we got to play that trick on ourselves. And that's part of what, you know, a lot of people do this. I personally did this to myself all the time when I was really like addicted to social media. Like when I say addicted, I mean like chronically addicted. You know, I'd spend a lot of time and I had a, I had a, 
a dumb little thing that I did when I'd scroll on Instagram. I'd scroll, I'd have my phone in front of my face, I'd say five, four, three, two, one. And then I would never specify whether or not I was done on my fifth scroll or my scroll where I get from one or my scroll where I get to zero. So I'll be mm-hmm. like, oh, let me go to zero. And I'm like, oh, oh shit, I beat it. Like I missed my goal, five, four, three, two, one. And I keep doing it, right? So I'll end up doing like 40, 40 scrolls before I even realize. But if I told myself originally 40 scrolls, then I would have never done it in the first place. So I right. think that sort of psychology is used against us. Why don't we use it for us, right? Why don't we say, instead of saying, I'm going to go, using the analogy of scrolling, right? I'm going to go 40 scrolls. No, I'm not going to go 40 minutes to the gym. No, I'm just going to go five minutes to the gym. No, I'm going to do push-ups on the floor right now mm-hmm. and, you know, sit-ups, whatever, and do this. You know, I'm only going to do 10 sit-ups, like whatever. If you do something so small, then not only is there potential for you to go and go further, but also you're developing those little habits of, mm-hmm. okay, you know what? I did 10 sit-ups today. That makes me feel good, right? That's 10 more sit-ups than yesterday. And that's the nice consistency that comes with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about building the consistency and, and changing the identity and, and yeah, really just being consistent with like, that's the number one thing is have to be consistent. Yeah, no, I find that, I find that so incredibly awesome. So awesome. Let's see. So honestly, I think, I think that's a good spot to end it, but we do have a few, uh, one last question. And that is how can people get in touch with you? Where can people find you and how can people sign up for the course, the cookbook and a one-on-one session if they want? Yeah, absolutely. So my main place right now has been TikTok. Um, I've, I'm also on Instagram. Those are the two main places that I, that I, I hang out at. And I also do TikTok lives almost every day during the week. Wow. And so you can, you know, tune in and, and um, you know, if you're on TikTok, you can tune in and just, uh, you know, I talk about random health things. Like I, I go on my whiteboard and I, I do some little, uh, I teach some different things about health. Like I talked, I talked about stress the other day. Um, I do open Q and A. So, you know, I can just answer your personal questions. Um, wow. And then and can yeah. we, can we commend this man? He has 87,000 followers on TikTok. He's not, <laughs> he's not doing anything light over here. He has 87,000 followers. And that's how I, that's how I originally found you because I thought you were incredibly, incredibly interesting and your content was incredible. But keep oh, going. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so yeah, TikTok, Instagram are the main places. And then to get the cookbook, um, the course or schedule a one-on-one. Uh, I think the best thing to do is just put the links um, in this uh, in this podcast or wherever you know wherever you want to put the links. And um, it's done. It'll be there. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, so people just click on those links. And they'll be labeled like what goes to what. Um, yeah. The cookbook is. Um, I think it's a great place to start. Like again, like we're talking about starting small. If you're not ready to to invest in a course or one-on-one, like the cookbook, you know, five bucks. So just that's about the cost of a, uh, you know, Starbucks specialty drink. So it's all about, is it, are you willing to invest a small amount of money into your health, which, you know, if you're not, then, you know, that's okay. That's, you know, your, your choice. Um, but for just five bucks, it's, you know, a very small investment to get a huge reward for being a healthier role model for your kids, feeling more energetic and just losing the weight and feeling healthier. So um, yeah, that should answer, answer those questions, right? Oh, I think it's awesome. I think I think any anything that is for self improvement, no matter what it is, it's an investment. That's all it is. You know, I, I think right now, um, you know, at Indiana University, the average tuition is like forty thousand dollars. People are willing to spend that for this sort of self improvement, but at the same time, they're not willing to spend. You know, first of all, I mean, I I think I spent when I was younger. I think I spent like two hundred dollars on a on an online course. From, I think it was Tony Robbins or it was Dean Graziosi actually because I was, I was just like there this is so worth it this is so incredibly mm-hmm. worth it so I commend you I really do I yeah, and, you. and something quick that I saw today was uh, I got a uh, um, a flyer for the dentist today and it said for just $99 a month you know you can get braces for your kids and it's like nine, I know braces are like I don't know five grand or, or maybe more than that um, it's like you're, are you, you're willing, like, what's your, how are, why are you willing to invest in your kids, you know, teeth? Like that's, it, you know, it's, I, you know, I got braces and everything. And I think it's, you know, they're important. Um, but think about if you're willing to invest five grand into your kid's teeth, are you willing to invest like, you know, something on the outside? Are you willing to invest on taking care of the inside so you can keep 
the things on the outside actually healthy because the food is the fuel for like all, you know, everything on the outside. It's a fuel for all of our cells, for our brain, for our heart, all of it. So for, you know, if you're willing to spend that much money on braces, think, just think about that in comparison to, you know, taking care of you from the inside and actually being able to be there for your kids. Like if you had to spend 99 bucks a month to be, um, you know, super healthy for your kids, have more energy and just be able to hang out with them and, and be there for them. Like, is that worth it? Like, is that a good investment? And I, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, that's not what I tried um, an analogy. Uh, um, but yeah, definitely when it comes to our health, it, it, it's an investment. It's not an expense, um, an investment because it's an investment in our future. And for, um, it's, one of the most important investments we can make. Like we invest in houses, we invest in cars, but what about our health? You know, how much are we spending on our health? Cause it's just, it's just that important. I agree. I agree. Dr. Scott, this is a great podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nick. It was a pleasure.